We evolved from birds, you and I. We came up through their throats with a hoo hoo and a chickadee dee. We are flesh and musical tone. Some tried to separate us in fits of militarism, religious zeal, or apathy. When your children are born, I'm the lullaby, say goodnight. Before they can say good morning, I am menomina, do 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 do. I train children to remember one, two, buckle my shoe, and that this is the song that never ends. Grade schoolers all fall to pieces. Fatty, fatty, two by four. Mothers kiss away falling tears and hug whisper soothing ballads. How much do I love you? We are conjoined, never parted. You filled me with silly clowning. Let me tell your enduring love and grimace in your heart-strung grief. I have cherished you, your voices and interweaving instruments, swelling breath upon breath, mingling hydrogen and oxygen in treble and bass. Celebration! I am Willow River movement in your guided meditation. When you cannot lift up your head for the weight of stinging loss, I am the somber, reverent dirge, carrying you through life's sorrow. This is the song that never ends. Through all of this, I held you up, while daily you drag me down. I desired to disown you. I would slice away and sever your clenched unholy vocal cords from my measures and melodies. No onslaught of optimism. I clinked in the chains of another carnage, each bloody note dragged in the dirt with the corpses you called other. When you filled me with ignorance and your dagger-headed hatred, I so longed to be rid of you. You goaded your young sisters to dance to the beat of their own degradation. You made your black brothers eat strange fruit with ropes and coils. You ignored your wield, blinded, deaf. I bear the weight of my own sound. I recall each generation, their haunting chants and grim echoes. This is the song that never ends. Justice, not countless choruses, it is all too familiar. I would wrest my rhythm from you if my death would end your bloodshed. This is the song that never ends. We came from the birds, you and I. Anymore, I wish I had stayed in the sweet song of the sparrows. Thank you. For anyone who is confused by that piece, it is a persona piece from the perspective of music as an entity. Okay, so a couple of years ago, the city, the city officials decided they were gonna to put together a comprehensive plan, and they were gonna pay big money for this. So I wrote a poem. The man has a plan. The man has a plan of how to make this city better. The man is smart about parking and focusing small at first. The man has a plan about the people who belong in this city, but it doesn't include you. Or you, or you, or me. We're not clean enough. Some of us take the bus, walk, or bike. A few of us are smokers. Our jobs are not prestigious. Our bank accounts don't have enough digits and heaven forbid we be among those dreaded renters. Mm -hmm. The man has a plan of downtown resnobization. It is balmy in concept, but dastardly in execution. The man has a plan. First on his list is to get rid of those people who eat in the park on Sundays. Those people, the smelly, mangy, rowdy lot who show up for free food and a fistful of dignity. They are not welcome in his perfect vision. The man with a plan seeks young white professionals to live in the lofts of a former luxury hotel. Where the teeming masses will go is not his concern. Out with non-traditional students and recovering junkies. Out with the call center workers on their breaks and the hungry poor people who dare to line up in public. Out with support services, out of sight and out of our minds. <laughs> In with some musicians and artists, except the poor ones, he plans to price them out. This is hardly class warfare. This is nuisance extermination. The man has a plan, and it's a good one. 
if you don't read all 97 pages. <laughs> to somebody I heard being concerned um, about what, what would happen after they die. You are not going to hell. You're not going to hell. Nobody is, and definitely not you. The church tried to sell our souls back to us as frightened puppets, each of us paying over and over. Their scam has run its course. We know the good news in each cell of our bodies. It has nothing to do with blood washing or obedience to a highly variable code. God has hidden God's self in the last place many of us might look, inside of us. Original sin lied to us, constructed a torturous narrative, and convinced most people to live fear into existence. Oh, but the mystics knew. The mystics recognized the face of God in each of us. They saw through the illusion that holy and human are separate, when in fact, we never stopped being love. The institution used words like heretic, false prophet, witch, and sinner to condemn those they could not control. But we are love, and we are not going to hell. We are the embodiment of the divine, each of us, whether we feel empowered or not. Sin is not doing bad things, it's any perception that separates us from knowing that God is in us and we are in God. We are love. They said that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. What they left out is, so are we. There is no angry God who must be appeased by a sacrifice to the death. There is only the spirit who longs for each of us to know our true intended nature. We are not going to hell. We may create a hell for each other, but we also have the power to know each other. The divine in me recognizes the divine in you. How absurd that this notion seems Eastern instead of native to everywhere. So no, sweetheart, you are not going to hell. You cannot lose God's love because it is not conditional no matter what they said. Now go and be love because love is who you are. summary here because I know so many things about her I could spend all the rest of our time introducing you to her. But some of the things that she wants you to know about her are unicorns, family, love, LGBT, Islam, America, HP, which stands for Harry Potter, not Hewlett Packard in this case. Love, poetry, idealism, and Narnia. So please welcome Andy Line. <laughs> Please help me eat later this evening. Um, and you actually, for $6, get parts one and two, which were originally published separately. Woo! Two for the price of one. Two for the price of one. But I've got to find it, because I didn't mark it first. Is it not in this book? <gasps> I grabbed the wrong book, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, let's do this one anyway. I was going to do a poem called Turn Around about um, recovery from addiction. Um, but this one will do. Um, it's actually about being in addiction as opposed to the recovery part, which I promise you is way better. Okay, uh, this is called Hallelujah. This relapse doesn't love as hard as the last one. 
The Cheshire cat inside my head grins with broken teeth like shattered glass and whispers, we're all mad here. His spit is dripping with self-inflicted malevolence, the blood red color of the lipstick around the pipe. When the alien color trails and ringing in my ears draw me up to heaven again, I know I don't need religion. I turn my back on Allah and every sacred, sacred stone lining the narrow path. I trade butterfly kisses for one more hit in the boulder on my back. Just give me something to wrap my tongue around. My tolerance has far surpassed my rhyme scheme, cursing myself with each each smoke-laden exhale, I cry. Throw me against the hearth with my fault lines rupturing in a blaze of the full moon's light, like a mean drunk in a thick crowd, never pausing to say, excuse me. The effect makes every muscle in my body clench and release, clench and release over and over as if I'm subconsciously trying to turn myself inside out. Every noose of smoke, every neon blinking skylight, every seizure is trying to talk all at once and I won't hear any of them. Broken family picture frames trace ever shorter lifelines and crimson on my palms. I drop to my knees one more time and cry, our Lord do not impose upon us that which we have not the strength to bear. I will stay clean this time. Strength, Lord, wisdom, and courage, inshallah just for today, amen. Inside Out is my drug of choice. I keep searching for that ultimate secret, the greater than that will take me away from here. After all, I'm special, I'm not like them. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm special. These are the nights I wish I had nothing to lose. I've never stopped, but God, I am tired, I'm just, so tired, I surrender. What is like the censorship rating on this book? PG-13. <laughs> PG, it's PG-13. PG-13. You need to write something really quick. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> okay. ah, I wish I had brought the other one. Okay, so life happens. Disorganized artists. We'll go back to the actual plan set list. Okay, so these next few poems are from my. What time did I go on? You have like another five minutes to okay. go. Um, from my my forthcoming book from Writing Nights called The Audacity of Flight, um, and this is called Through Her Eyes. After wondering and worrying and questioning, I was gently assured that I have grown more than I can see. The tree cannot see through its branches how close it is to the sky. It can only see how far it has come up from the ground, but often forgets to look down. Does a rose know it has bloomed or does it just feel the sun? Does a river know it has flooded or does it just feel the pool of the ocean? the growing current sweeping it toward the splinter of dirt. I feel truth closer than my skin, so close that we are inside of each other, and I become him, and he becomes me. I can taste the truth of my unity, but I cannot see through my branches how much longer until I touch the sky. She reminds me how far I have come reaching and stretching and seeking from the ground up. And I recognize the light of God in me when I look through her eyes. Okay, this one's called Dandelions. And I actually have the tattoo that is spoken of. It's a true story. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a yellow dandelion tattoo on my chest so it would never leave me. Like the dandelions in my parents' front yard that they keep running over with the lawnmower. But no amount of weed killer has ever been able to stop them. Like the dandelion, there were times I survived out of pure obstinance and no obstacle has ever been able to stop me. Weeds are misunderstood flowers. That's why they're my favorite. 
I'd rather my lover stop for goldenrod than present me with a dozen roses. Despite their publicity, I've never seen a rose grow in the middle of a sidewalk, but a dandelion <laughs> seeds ride on the wind oblivious to boundaries, like me seeking out my limitations just to defy them. Pull over on the side of a back road. Get out of your car and stop to smell the daisies and the honeysuckle and the Queen Anne's lace. Roses are fragile and need special attention and care. But those damn dandelions will grow anywhere. I love Narnia. I really do. It's, it's in my bio. And um, I've read like the Chronicles of Narnia series like, I don't know, like six times the whole way through in chronological order because that's the way the story goes. And if you want to fight with me afterwards, <laughs> it's not the way it was written, but that's the way the story goes. It's not my fault C.S. Lewis screwed his timeline. Up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Narnia. This is, this is about, um, I wrote this right after I finished the series the last time through. Right here in this world, in this room, the space of breath between this book and you, there is magic. Worlds are born and die, are, and are reborn within us. I do not need a course in miracles, because I am a miracle. If I know myself, I know God. You are a miracle. If I love you, I love God. We are one star dreaming it of itself. Inside of us is the birth of Narnia. We are created from the breath of Aslan. We are alive with the magic of creation that lies beyond words and dreams and the comprehension of mankind. Some things are so strong that they cannot be described. Some things are so vast that they cannot be seen. The purest of truths can only be felt. That is the fabric of our being. Truth is the cloth, cloth that we have cut from, all of us from the same one. Even science becries this magic. String theory declares that all things are connected by invisible strings of electricity. So is there really any difference between you and me? I do not end, and you do not begin. We are different formations in the same clay. <coughs> Bodies and names are as superficial as makeup when it comes to the spirit. Love is the highest power. Love is the energy that binds us together. It is birth and life and death and rebirth and light and darkness and maiden and mother and crone. Open your, the eyes of your heart and see the beauty and drink the wine of the magic alive in all of mankind. All right, thank you very much, Andy. I'm going to live stream a little bit so, so people can see who all is here. Yay, cheer for yourselves, because you're awesome. <laughs> all right, our next poet. Uh, our next poet writes poetry because it is his pleasure, it calls him down. Please give a hand for John Walters. Yeah. Okay. This poem is this poem is called Eric. Why did you go so soon? I miss you. I know you're in a better place. Eric, you meant so much to me. You you were someone I looked up to. You were someone I could run to, Eric. This poem is actually about my grandma. Grandma, I knew a lady we call her Jean. She had a wonderful soul. She loved me, Grandma, now that she is gone. I remember the holiday. I know she is a shooting star, Grandma. I wrote this one last night, it's called Rainbow. Look at the colors, see how they glow. See the love it brings. Feel the autumn breeze, Rainbow. So shiny and bright. So good in my sight. Follow it where it goes, rainbow. I 
I just wrote this one today. It's called, What is that beam of light I see in front of my face? It is a white light of, or a lamp. Is it, this, is it the sun that shines bright? Or is it the Lord with all his glory? Where is that beam of light I see in front of my face? Is it the angels coming to take me to my resting place? It, it shines through my window. It shines, it's, it is the sun bright in the sky. What is that beam of light I see in my face? It is God saying hello. It is my dad looking down on me. What is that beam of light I see in front of my face? What, why do I feel blue inside? Why am I crying? This beam of light I see in front of my face. This one actually has to do about hate, but it says, where's the love? Why so much hate in the world today? Why are they fighting? Why can't we get along? Love, where is the love? You can keep going. Okay. I'll let you know. This one is called pain. Pain, will it go away? Why do I feel it? Is it deep down inside? Pain, is it this? What is this? I sit and cry. I just wanted to be healed. Pain. This one is called past. It is gone. It doesn't live here anymore. I don't have to worry about the pain. The past, I'm not going to let it, let it get me. I'm going to move on. My life is mine. The past, my sorrows is all gone. This, is, this one is called family. It could be blood, it could be friends, it could be church, family. Where does it, what does the word mean? What is it? Family. And I also wrote a poem about better block. What is on, what is on your block? What can we do to make it better? Can we show love? Better block, can we show peace? Can we hold hands? Can we walk together? Better block, look. There is a rebuilding happening. Can we can we pray together? Can we feed each other better block? Thank you, John. Let's give a hand to Delhi, Ohio, because they're hosting us here. All right, Derek Terrell is our next performer, but I haven't seen him yet. Is Derek Terrell around anywhere? Derek? Okay. Well, um, Kristen Wurstler was actually supposed to be the, uh, the 130 person, but she apparently has, as Azo put it, she has throwing up reasons for not being here. <laughs> um, so yeah, then the, po the poet after it was supposed to be Derek Terrell, who I don't see. So, I one real quick yes, absolutely. You want to, John? Yeah. Sure. Go for it. Okay. So, I think a lot about changing the world, and I love events like this because we're doing it, right? So, I, I actually, this actually came to me in an inspiration as I was driving one day, and I never forgot it. And it's been a little bit psyched ever since. I kind of envisioned it to be uh, like an narration to open the TV show about changing the world, actually. So. I don't know what I'm supposed to go on after, and Derek. Is it too late? Are you able to go um, after John tonight? Yes, thank and you. And maybe tell me what you see in your mind's eye after you listen to this. Why do people belittle each other rather than help one another? And why do people say you can't change the world? In reality, people do change the world, more so than any other species on the planet. In fact, if you can't change the world, you must not be human. Because mm. that, more than anything, is what humans do. I'm here to tell you that we can change the world, and will, for the better, together, as we are connected. Because when everyone does better, everyone does better. Everything is. Everything. Be it. And build a better block. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, John. All right, so we're going to move on to Zachary Lee, who has, he, he describes himself as a soul with a body. He's a son of stars, artist, writer, and poet. Please give it up for Zachary Lee. <laughs> Thanks to Skylark and Azrael and Delhi for hosting us. Uh, you're probably gonna have to let me know when I'm out of time. You're fine, just and, keep going. Uh, whenever I first uh, was behind a mic with Writing Nights, it was over at Culture Coffee, and I was a young, mousy, fledgling poet. And uh, hopefully a little more than that now. So, I'll start off with a piece that is in my first book that I published. to find it. Alright, actually I added that to another piece right at the end, so I'll just read the whole one. Intertidal always, a species softly separate, convenes choral characters to compose a city beneath the waves. Atlantis lives. At communion, Mad Leg's microphone let loose all primal shred when she's vexed, coiled and red and seething in secondhand glow. It's possibly the best show I've seen here yet, a friend possessed by passion and past. The music recommenced, not a single soul failed to dance. They were all, I don't know, entranced. By she, the ghost that got me gallivanting through the mondegreens in search of sense to salvage. She told me she wants to make organic soaps and sell them for pearls. Apparently oysters make the finest stones. And then she began her final song, a soothing ode to thunderstorms. She called it, you can exhale now. The world will wear you like a new pair of shoes, moves you, breaks you in, spins you through cycles of self to cleanse the stains. This world will wear you like a new pair of shoes, wounds you, bends your tread, showers you in sentiments meant to mold you into the masterpiece we each all could be. Okay. Something so soaring, something staunch, something soothing to those unsung. Incandescent newspaper, conversations with a stranded stranger on a bus going nowhere, leaving last goodbyes in the color of the sea. Yellow law of gods and man. Searing drums blasted out by battle, gourmet goddess, Oshu, arise. That's not the end, but thank you. <laughs> Crisp campfires, hear, stare, smile. I see you, dancing as wind, as sea foam, coddled by mountain ranges. Beaches aloft with eye rises, high tide. September valentines, the essence dampened by madness. Sensual sadness secretes souls awaiting waking by word. Cover stories, the birds. Time is what turns information into mythologies, lived histories to libraries, where in each page I can take away my tragedies. Time is what dances at the end, end of grace, end of loss, end of all you've ever scoffed at, end of mountains tamed and lions climbed, end of need for time. Time is what turns information into mythologies, the aimless into families, Time is what turns bronze into an age and a soulless to a sage. Time is what dances at the end, the end of your hate, the end of your plate, your weight, your broken hearts. Time is an old flame addicted to, to the fountain of youth. Time is when you finally manage to move on. Time is your fingers, your palms, your nails, your psalms. Your shadows puked external have stained the hourglass. Your shadows cut by Occam's edge have yet to trouble your brain. It is doubtful. Time is what burns away the bullshit. Time is what talks. Time is what raises the stakes, what inspires and procreates. Time exists, so we must manage it. We exist, so we may conquer it. She, this thunder I dissolve in to breathe, has beckoned me and baffled me endlessly for every day I've been alive thus far. And I would like to thank her, the thunderous and her children, rain, snow, hail, and all the cycles of synchronicity she has so gracefully spread over and upon me guiding me toward ever-brightening horizons and through ever more intricate grottos to get to wherever the hell it is that she knows I need to go. Because I've got this weird feeling 
a tingle in the back of my head, the goosebumps that ring down my neck, that what I've envisioned for my life is barely even scratching the surface of what her divine thunderous has decided. And that goes for all of us. I think the treasure of our lives is that we are mortal. We do not live forever, and that very fact is what makes everything we love, care about, hope, dream, imagine, sweat out in such style, cry over, scream about, contemplate, observe, ponder, sing of, paint to imitate, and obsess over, so goddamn sacred. So I sublime myself into you to express my gratitude. And if we have one latitude to confess to, shed our dress and shed our place, wound within a tenor of place, to endure again a truth befit, to dissolve the boundaries between us and admit that we don't know shit. The cosmic giggle has got us good, and every heartbeat it can be heard. A kingdom maniacal and carnival candid, calculating characters to rebel against the page. This is the age we live in. So now, in communion, I walk with the deity that is me, through sunsets and communal gardens growing plants to eat. And in pollen-choked spring, I fall asleep and dream that she will speak to me, reveal the lightning philosophy penned by archangels in a time long before humanity imprisoned them in lungs used to breathe. She assimilates to plunder, decimates with thunder, copulates to remember the seed, the tree, the fruit, the flower, rendered young in our final hour. We astonish, we archaic, we gift breath to those who brave it. There's the end. Can you speak closer to the mic, please? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, this next one I wrote about a conversation that an uh, old friend of mine and I had. Um, I believe we were at Mugs Wigs, and we were somewhere around here. Uh, and he was talking about he, how he didn't feel like he really had any Im impact or that he was feeling meaninglessness pretty much and I was uh, kind of uh, opposing him through this part. A jewel utilized by bioluminescent fools twisting tongues over moonlight, spritzed with light diamonds in the blind blood body. Caught in distance, inertia vibrant, our paranormal, timeless, geeks out in pints of sunshine. Will you beam me back again before the mothership's dead, the prehistoric pledge? Instead of worshiping gods invisible, our faith belongs in humans indivisible. Your, your heart is a crystalline planet. I would live on there for ages. A teepee of modeling clay structured with sound and tension. Come to me and claim your pension. Pearlescent Pueblos dealt out good hands to the people. Hands that work, forged, and weathered. Hands that bleed, tied, and tethered. Hands that dream, aged in the liquor of your mind tonight. Birthstone pines for your static conquest. This jewel defies its master's prowess. But I chase the dream down to landscapes, lawless. A jewel in the dross pointed south by palms of frost will enter humbly the kingdom within, disguised as the holiest of holy sin. But I swear to you there's something to it, a groove you can't help but dance to. We decide to be abundant, we soar with gods inside of us, because we can finally see the heaven inside each other, like a mirror of evolving atomic ecstasies. Homo oxymoronis. Three minutes. Luna June, a mighty fire where lightning bugs dance in nervous vibratos to avoid those spinning unnecessary cocoons. Moths, good friends, and nighttime turn their sweet. Have you hinted at an apparition of me? There's something darling in the budding of a dream. Parts of me awake from mat night to a concave hallway of niche, nooks, and doors. Biomes on the bottom rung. Lessons from the number line give me directions to the sun, our holy solar one. The light is most blinding to the ones that are shining, and remember, you rob the ground of sunlight. You cast a shadow, which is proof your actions impact others. But don't feel down for your thievery from ground as you convert those rays into usable energy, biophotons, and cancer, all mutations of natural selection. There's nothing like the moon calling you in June, a midnight brew in the chatter of keys, a fire show in the autumn breeze. I paint bioluminescent scenes to a drumming from the catacombs of forest and mine. Blue Maw of Coral Gaia. Merging the mediums of our reality, velocity, filling out my armory of lyricism, cynicism, and sarcasm inside of me, sullenly fluctuating between honorable and heartless, blessed be the marvelous mysterium thrust upon us at birth. Part of your worth comes from your awareness of it. 
If you let me in, I can harness the light in your biophotons, teach you how to use it as a flashlight, show you new worlds underneath the black light, nihilism track marks on my mind, Guantanamo lucid dreams, I feel your, I feel your heartbeat and it fuels me to so fly through this world lit by nuclear slap fights. We lived during a time when any temper tantrum could not only result in our extinction, but a farewell to everything on this rock. We used to propose a toast for those who, who we care for the most, those who change us from ghosts to a being that can accomplish something more than a haunting. We need to make compassion more than just a hobby and realize we are controlled by the wood of the holly, oscillating like LEDs on Molly, turning us mentally, epileptically, hysterically into a shell of ourselves, and training our brains to ignore the bond between and instead idolize a light illusory. Um, time? Um, one more short piece. Okay. We are fleeting creatures making permanent decisions, bound in coils, cycles repeated, winding, playing endless samsara in the desert, parking lot earthquakes, gunshot, meltdown of face structure by gasoline, ghost grenades conspire from inside our wallets. They underground run this planet, our generation of pariahs, candied over eyes, selling lashes and bombings, street-born illness kids, sick on heaven and running, snorting moons in our sleep, Traversing canopies of mind, all the while treading the line between our own reality and the empty. Audio celebrations in the skies of Alaska. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. I heard somebody groan over here. Is that because they're very sad that Zach is off the mic? No, no, no. My little girl fell asleep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Our next poet describes himself as urban poetry at its best. Please welcome Derek Terrell. Good. I run a little late, so I don't have all my material. This one's coming from my third book. It's, it's called Stoppers Thoughts That Turn Into Action. You see, I knew when I first seen you jogging around the block that for me to get adjacent with you, I'd have to drop off, drop some scheme or some plot. So early the next day, without invading your personal space, I quietly pursued you, and we ended up in a went Dixie parking lot. And I can see it just like it was yesterday. We finished up at the same time, go through the same cashier line, before a hot second dry eyes met up with mine. But my flashback is interrupted by headlights, so I squat. After enjoying the view of watching you shop, now I'm not the type to eavesdrop, but since I was in your neighborhood, I decided to post outside your bedroom window like a prop. And finally, there you stand within the confines of your window pane, gaze in my direction and remove your time. During my self-satisfaction, I almost had a faint hand of flop, but once again, my flashback is interrupted by headlights, so I squat. It was in that moment that I know I fell in love with the cream of the crop. Something about the way your frame framed your silhouette with low wants that led me to do what they call a Facebook stop. Your cell number was on there, but understand that I meant no harm when I called and hung up. And it was just because it was four o'clock. But baby, I wanted to hear your voice, and since it's so early, I really didn't want to talk. Yes, it's me that keeps calling private and hang. But when you pick up, my mind can't figure out some kind of line to pick up. Hold on. I just called once again and I got your robot. Maybe I should have called out fly. But then my thought is interrupted by headlights, so I squat. Because I will not allow these raindrops nor the cops to stop information This morning I missed you so much that I followed you and now you're caught. That little brunch date you went on with that buff dude with the BMW with the license plate that went sky has my temperature heated way past high. I'm just sitting too close to him with your legs crossed. 
and your right hand was too close to its heart. I can't handle it, so thank God that that thought was interrupted by headlights, so I squat. Duct tape, a rope, band, and a glove. This is where you're taking us, so this is what I've got. As soon as I see you, wait. Slow headlights from the BMW, Thank you. This one is uh, a one night stand postponed. A rap brought her for Olu Yonker. Differently, I come across as a jerk or a jack. Perchance I can play the fool, the jester, or the any. True? Well, I just want to get this drunken Mary Maiden into my humble abode. As people with conversation, I inquire, how art thou? Here I ask you if she has she obtained a bow yet. Tonight, the answer doesn't pertain to me. As the main and I had journeyed to an adjourned part of the pub, I have no plans for the final summer, I pray, I say, because all I want to do is get this drunk mate into my own little boat. The main responds in agreement. Attempting not to be as lazzled as I am, we exit without paying a bill, taking the rear exit. Part, I follow my buddy. To depart, we arrive at her steed. We saddle up and she plays still with. Destination is conquered, alas. I have this drunken mate in my humble abode. I present a box of crushed grapes as libation. Her face is twisted, for she informs me that she likes to smoke. To get her feeling of, of relax and hope together, I bowl some teddy tea. The drunken mate and myself adventure to the bed chain for prophylactics, a breakfast for I am not baseless, you know. The drunken mate with common sea on dresses. After she lies upon the bed, I submerge underneath the linen to give her nothing to taste. Next, I arise with a furious anger, throwing the covers off me because after finally getting the married maiden to my humble abode, her twat have a quat. Thank you. Yeah, you definitely have time for one more. This one is, why the militarization of police? Since the government has played the role of the bank, the police have, that started with nightsticks now have tanks. It all starts at the Pentagon and its 1033 program and ends in city streets resembling wars on foreign lands. So what are the rules of engagement? Why are these city soldiers armed and march on our pavement? Fitted with Kevlar guns, M16s, tear gas, pepper spray, Humvees, L, R, A, D sound cannons, and, resist and vehicles resistant to landmines. Just as a warrants good for, you know, payable by the crime. The wide American militarization of police, officers are, not, officers are not tutored to handle such type of arson. The gap between soldier and officer is significantly become marginal. The uh, compass has reached and by a loophole with murders and getting away scot free and should even be paroled. What is the judgment call that is now defaulted by the use of force with the constant, constant brutality of citizens preserving an unbiased? narrative and resume for force without one their certain type of one-sided freedom that kill them like bones. Thank you. What's that? Can I have you just hold that for a little oh, while? Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Let's give it up another time for Derek. Next 
poet is actually out at my booth right now. So I'm gonna introduce right her, here, I'm gonna run, you are here now, okay, awesome. So, Nick Ann Charney is a poetress of her own kind. So please welcome Nick Ann. Peter Pan's Reflection. I found myself sitting, staring down the edge of too many blades in this place. I found myself standing on the edge of too many messed up yesterdays, too many people, too many places, so little time. Breasts still here, breasts untaken will never be mine. I stand on the ocean shore thinking I won't be able to breathe anymore. I stand here with broken bones rebuilt. The glue is seeping, but I find a way to go. I'm searching for a home, but I seem to be looking in all of the wrong places. I'm searching for home, but I can't seem to find the key. I'm searching for home, not just a house, but a home, because lately it's been hard to find one in this place. It's been hard to find one in me, a place where hearts find a way to beat again, a home where when you walk through the door, you're embraced with so much love, and it is impossible not to breathe it in through the air. I'm searching for a place that some say doesn't really exist, but ma'am, I forgot to tell you, I find myself as Peter Pan's reflection. I am searching for Neverland, and your comments of such a place does not exist, young one, only makes me search that much harder. Living in a world so broken, how could you function without believing in the better of it? Some days, thinking such things is a better place here is what keeps me breathing. When a fraction of your days are spent tearing up your skin with blades to manage the pain inside, you have to look at the tiniest of glimmers that you will have in your life because one, just one, might turn out to be your moon. some would say I shouldn't write about but your personal keep your personal life to yourself they would say but I can't keep a secret in when my body's earning for you scream so loud it's deafening hold on one second it's not the right one whoa Maddie thanks for looking at me girl you got me Sorry guys, hold on, I love you guys. <laughs> you got me, it's okay, I'll read this one. All right, that's, let me just, I love you guys, you got me. All right, so this is called Beautiful Blue Eyed Princess. All right, you know, I don't get it. She is the most beautiful little girl I have ever seen in my life. But instead, you choose to sit around or run to Texas instead of being her dad. Her blue eyes used to look into mine, and I used to feel bad for her because she didn't have you. Well, you know what? I don't anymore. I was her daddy. I kissed her boo-boos. I put her to bed. I tucked her in. I showed her what love is. She doesn't need you. I, at 17, was playing daddy better than you will ever be able to. She never needed you. Now one year, almost two years later, she has a wonderful daddy. So now you decide because he wants to change her last name and one day adopt her, you want to all of a sudden care. Her last name wasn't even yours to begin with. You will have to shoot and kill me if you ever get visitation. I would lock myself away with her like the princess that she is. You, you were supposed to be the king, but you are nothing. You are the jester in this fairy tale. The joke here is you. She needs to be taught that she is a castle concealed with gold only to be opened by those who are worthy. She must know to hold her chin high because her tiara does not fall that way. I will teach her how to swim instead of drown in her own tears. She will look into the mirror, never doubting if she is the fairest of them all because I will let her know every day how beautiful she truly is. This little girl will always know I will be her knight in shining armor when she needs me. 
The only fire that will catch the tower she lives in will be from that of which that burns from her passionate soul. She will know undoubtedly that princesses are able to save themselves too. We don't always need a prince. We don't always need a king either. She learned at a young age that queens are just as capable of being the king too. So you just live as the jester. She will live happily ever after, perfectly fine without you. Dear Sue, you might not even remember my name anymore. <coughs> you may never even hear this. The last time you saw me, I was probably six. I'm 18 now. You missed 12 birthdays. It's July 10th, in case you forgot. You probably did. To my biological grandmother. I just got a phone call yesterday. I am officially enrolled in college. I got my packet about apartments. I'm moving to Florida in 220 days, but you won't visit me. I'm getting A's and B's during my senior year currently, but you won't see me. In a week, I start my first college class in life, but you won't see me. I got through 12 years of school without you. You never saw me. I learned to ride a bike, but you didn't see me. I learned to write poetry, but you've never heard me. I learned why she takes so many drugs to the point where she slurs her words and can't see straight and really doesn't even know her kids. But you would never say that is your fault, now would you? I know more than you think I do. Maybe if you do remember, you think they told me some sugar-coated story of why you left or were kicked out of my life. So I wouldn't be so hurt. It bothered me for a long time when people would ask if there was anyone in my life that I hated, I said you. The only name I said was yours. It made me feel horrible that I only hated one person on this planet. You have not seen me in 12 years and you still made me hate you. It made me hate you that I can't talk to her because of you. It made me hate you that I have to explain why I, when I did talk about you, I called you by your first name. You being one of the few people that are supposed to be biologically programmed to love me by birth, and you don't. It makes me hate you that you call yourself as Christian, but I think you have done things that even God would find unforgivable. It makes me hate you that we have the same last name. There are a hundred, several thousand things that make me hate you, but honestly, I'm tired. Tired of having only one person in this world that I have to create a list to be on. One list with one name, yours. But still, I now I will erase it. Your name, the title on the hypothetical list that I created, I won't erase what you've done. You must find a way to do that yourself. But now I am ready, ready to let go and throw into the trash the silent tears no one knew that I was once crying before. So now my list empty. I will graduate high school and dip my feet into the pool of life without you. I will no longer feel broken with hating you and only you. So to my biological grandmother, I no longer hate you. But don't ever come look for me just because I no longer hate you doesn't mean I forgive you for all the horror that you have caused and all those things that you did. Without love, Nick Ann Michelle Charney. P.S. Yes, that is my name.
and they were telling me, do I tell my significant other about my mental illness? Like, I don't know what to do. Like, is that something that I have to preface this with? And I had felt the same way, and so I, I wrote this for us. It always feels like I have to tell someone before. Before we're friends, before we're lovers, before buying a car, because that might trigger me to break down into tears. I'm not good at decisions. Before we became acquainted, I have to tell you about that sinkhole I'm in, and that you might try to pull me out, and I might reach for your hand, and I might not. I might have the strength to pull one of my arms up, or I might be stuck all the way up to my neck, and at that point, I'll need some heavy equipment to get me out. They usually bring out the heavy equipment for me. The cranes that might take a while to work because I'm so delicate and they don't want to hurt me more. They bring out the 80 milligrams of SSRI. On top of that, they add the three milligram stuff that's supposed to help the 80 work better. But since I'm stuck so deep, they amp up the 300 to 450 because they think that in six weeks, it'll finally be helping. They switch that 0.5 two times as needed to a full one three times a day, no questions asked. And it's supposed to loosen me from the sinkhole. It's supposed to make it a little easier to pull me out. Maybe it will loosen enough that when you extend your hand to get me out, I'll be able to get mine out and you can pull. But maybe you're not there anymore. Maybe you couldn't wait any longer. You had to get back to everything else that was going on. And I understand, I really do. It's hard to just stand there and watch someone not be able to do anything for hours or days or weeks or months. But you can't really expect me to do much when I'm stuck in mud up to my neck. So I don't blame you but maybe now someone else will walk by and maybe they'll think they can help. The people who are new to sinkholes really seem to think they can make a change. But before they try to help, I should probably let them know. I always feel like I should tell them before.
After all, things become stronger after they are repaired. And I will continue to love you and spread hope, strength, and peace with every prayer and every honeybee. Hello, everyone. Hi. Sorry we had a hiccup between poets, but I think we made it all right. Let's give another round of applause for Ian. All right. Words that describe our next performer include, but are not limited to, poetry, feminism, books, coffee, happiness, and self-love. Please welcome Keely Aaliyah. So I don't necessarily have a title for this one, but it kind of has to go with a self-improving thing, and I'm always writing about self-improvement. So, my favorite thing about the summer is finding a boy who's going to break your heart in only a matter of three months. You won't love him, or at least I didn't, but something about him leaving is going to hurt much more than you had expected. We had met in May, and I had instantly decided to give him a label from his looks. We all do at least once or twice. <clears throat> I thought of him to be stuck up and completely full of himself, but I sure did fall for it. I didn't give in to the smirks and devious smiles until he asked for my number. I told myself, just keep it friendly and make it fun. And it was fun until texting and calling became a habit until I found myself confiding in him, telling him things that I normally wouldn't just tell anyone. Finding some sort of safeness within him, I found myself intrigued with learning new things about him. You would have never guessed just by looking at him that he was an artist. He drew characters and paintings that were so lovely, you would have never known that they, you could have never guessed that they were his. He often talked about his dead mother. He said it wasn't something he talked about a lot, but you made him feel like it was okay. He said I made him feel okay, I made him feel better. I found myself asking about his mother as if I wanted to impress her. I wanted her to know that, his, that her son wasn't interested in the wrong girl, but this was just supposed to be fun until I got nervous when he didn't call that night. Who wants to impress the mother of a boy you just want to have fun with? I didn't say I was perfect for him, but he did. I realized that I noticed when he was upset. He wasn't emotional, normally happy, but for how close we got, I could call his bluff on occasions. He got teary-eyed one time and said, I've never been with a girl who asked what was wrong. I guess I've never been with a girl who's cared like you. It makes me happy. Although, I wasn't with him. Maybe we were just getting too close too quick. Talking to him became a habit or maybe an addiction. I noticed the small things in his actions and words, yet it bothered him. I guess asking if he was okay and if I could get, if I could help got a little old. Caring got a little old. We started getting into a few random arguments over pathetic things, simple things. He thought he could fix the arguments with a laugh and smile, and I let it happen. We didn't argue much after because he was so sweet and it was so nice and I wasn't complaining. I let him get too close. He started talking about a girl he dated not too long ago, but long enough ago. He talked about a few things that she did that he regretted. He always said nothing too serious, but it was still regretful. He talked about the things she did wrong and I found myself taking note because I wanted to make myself perfect. I wanted to make him stay. I realized that the girl he talked about was the girl in the pictures, the pictures he never deleted because it didn't end badly. He started to ignore me. His texts became short and uninteresting. And when he called, he didn't have a lot of time to stay and chat. He still kept telling me secrets, but didn't seem to want to listen to my input. He stopped asking about my day. He stopped calling. He blamed, I called myself obsessive. I said I got too close, and I let this happen way too much. I said I just needed to let go, tell him I was done, and no longer wanted to proceed anything with him. After all, I wasn't even his girlfriend, even though that's exactly what it felt like. 
He blamed practice on the rare texts. He blocked me from certain aspects of his social media I questioned as to what I did wrong. He, could, he still called me perfect. I found new pictures of the girl in the old ones. He asked me why I only write about the hurts, why I only write about the things that make us feel so low. I thought to myself, unable to answer as to why, and just kept thinking, I'm not sure is my response. He said, well, there has to be something that makes you happy, and maybe you should write about that instead. I almost defended myself, but quickly realized that I do only write about what hurts. I did not answer. If I was confident enough in my ability, this would not have affected me. Too bad I like to take constructive criticism and always improve in some way. For weeks, I tried to write about things that make me feel happy and excited and humble and any other positive feeling I have experienced. I wanted to write about things that didn't hurt. I wrote about flowers and books and colors and voices smiles and compliments from friends and anything else that made me feel something positive within those few weeks nothing would just flow together. I stressed myself so heavily over something so pathetic and meaningless and easy to forget. I couldn't figure out why this was such a challenge until I realized. I write with passion. I write to make others feel something beyond their normal mindset. I write about what I feel. I write about things that I am beyond passionate about. Writing is never pointless to me. It is never an obligation. This is my personal expression. I make art. I make art in the form of words with a passion in my throat. You wouldn't examine a painting and tell the artist to do better. You will, expect, you will respect the art and move along whether you like it or not. Maybe my words don't make you feel the way you want to feel, but you won't tell me to do better or change it up. Maybe you just can't connect with the things I write about and that's okay. It isn't for everyone, but just because it isn't for you doesn't mean it isn't for anyone at all. I know that it inspires someone, even this. You don't understand any, you don't need to understand any aspect of it. You don't have to like it, but I won't stop writing. I write about the things that hurt and I won't stop writing about the things that hurt. This was my way to inspire others to speak out against and against things. This is my way to open the minds of others and make them realize there is more than one shade, of color, shade to every color. I write to express and I write to inspire. I write to make you feel, not feel belittled, but just the words on the paper or the words from my throat. I write and I will not stop. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for Keely. Before I introduce our next performer, I want to tell everyone about our show on October 13th over at the local. I wish they hadn't left until I said this, but whatever. Um, uh, Ianti, who was the poet before Keeley, is one of the owners of the place. Um, it's a really nice venue. Can't get really any reception there, but you know, just come for the poetry. And on the back of the flyers, we have poetry prompts. So if you're like, oh, I need some inspiration, get a flyer and then write something and then bring it and then share it on the open mic. Um, our next performer describes herself with uh, comic noir as interpretive speech and other stranger things. Please welcome Daria Quinn. physical media to uh, advertise, but I do have something resembling a band, uh, about five years worth of recordings, three full-length albums and four EPs. I have flyers that are exclu available exclusively as digital downloads on Bandcamp, and uh, this first bit is from the second full EP, which I called Art is Dead, because Pieces overrated, 
The population demands action, so that is what we give them. In the form of planes flown into buildings, tell me who's to blame. The president, the CIA, or a Middle Eastern boogie man, whose name we'll fill in later. <clears throat> Doesn't really matter. The motives are the same. It's blood for oil and God above who demands your compliance. There's panic in the streets. Thousands die, millions mourn as another tragedy becomes. Yet another battle cry. So here's a good excuse to offer up our children as a ritual sacrifice to the gods of revenge. Cause peace is overrated. about the Vietnam War. Bruce Springsteen was writing about a Vietnam veteran who came home after the war just to find that his entire life and the lives of his fellow veterans were all left shattered as a result. These veterans, these heroes as we like to call them, got screwed by the country they pledged themselves to defend. And, and a lot of people, they, they'll say that it was the liberal whiners, the hippies, the Black Panthers, the feminists, the people saying, make love, not war, and give peace a chance. There's people who will blame us, the people who came, and the people who came before us who were actually there, who were there at the sit-ins and the love-ins, people who put flowers in the barrels of rifles. They blame us for what happened to Vietnam veterans after, when they came home. <clears throat> but we're not the ones that took the money away from the veterans' hospitals. We're not the ones who refused to acknowledge the orange fever and PTSD these veterans suffered. We're not the ones who refused to hire them once they came home from Vietnam. We're not the ones, we're not the ones that wouldn't even let them keep a job parking cars. And yes, that is a line right out of First Blood. John Rambo was a representation of the lost generation of Vietnam veterans who Hollywood then decided to make a military action hero because we need sequels, goddammit. Because sequels equal money. And that right there is the problem. It's always about the money. America was sold a bad bill of goods when it came to Vietnam. The people in power kept telling us that this war was necessary. That we had to stop the spread of communism by any means necessary to protect our way of life. But we weren't fighting to protect our rights or our liberty. We weren't fighting to protect American lives. God knows we weren't there to really protect any lives at all. We were there to protect capitalism. <clears throat> and let us be clear, capitalism is why those veteran hospitals went underfunded. Capitalism is why Vietnam veterans couldn't find or keep a job once they came home. Capitalism is why PTSD went mostly und underdiagnosed and untreated for decades. Capitalism drove a lot of good men and women to suicide because that capitalism denied them the opportunity to reclaim the American dream that they gave up in order to fight for capitalism. And this doesn't end with war veterans, whether they're from Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, or a number of other places we station troops around the world. We know that the war machine is great for the economy, but terrible to the people whose blood is used to grease the gears, whether they're our soldiers or they're civilians. War is driven by greed, and greed is driven by capitalism. But it doesn't stop with war. Capitalism ru ruins our lives at home as well. 
Capitalism is why you work two full-time jobs just to afford a single bedroom apartment in a city the size of a dime. Capitalism is why Walmart workers and McDonald's workers need food stamps just to be able to afford to feed their families. Two of the largest employers in the world, worth billions of dollars each, can't pay their workers a living wage because of capitalism. Capitalism is why your insurance premiums are so high. It's why you put off necessary medical care and wait until it's so severe that you need to go to the emergency room just to get the care you need, and even then, you're still going into debt. It doesn't matter if you had a heart attack or a kidney stone. The moment you need medical help, you're going into debt because you had to choose between going to see a doctor and keeping the heat on in your home during the winter. It's why you can't afford to go to the dentist when your teeth hurt. It's why you can't afford to see a psychiatrist when you feel like you're starting to lose your mind. It's why you're planning to have yourself cremated because funeral costs are gonna put your children and grandchildren into debt. It's why you don't go to college because there's no guarantee you'll ever be able to pay off your student loans. Capitalism is so demanding that it won't ever let you off the hook for student loans, even if you fall into bankruptcy. You wanna know why the suicide rate is so damn high for people my age? I just explained it to you. We're overworked, underpaid, unable to afford the premiums we need to pay in order to get the proper, proper medical and psychological care we need. And the moment we even begin to try to improve ourselves, the moment we even think about going to college, we take on a massive debt we may never be able to pay off. No matter how many full-time jobs we have of a week, no matter how many pennies we're able to save after basic living expenses, because capitalism is always looking for one more way to squeeze every last possible asset it can take from us. Our time, our money, our health, our sanity, all of it are sacrificed on the altar of capitalism. There has to be a better way. There has to be a better way to honor the American dream, the sacrifice of soldiers whose lives have either been destroyed or taken away by the capitalist war machine. And it begins with us. It begins with teaching our children and our children's children to share, to show compassion, to care for those less fortunate, to care about the health and welfare of others because society is only as good as it is to its weakest and poorest citizens. The only way to make America great again is to prove to ourselves that we were ever great to begin with. And we do so by rewarding honesty and love and compassion instead of worshiping at the altar of capitalism. So how does everybody feel about Nazis? <laughs> Okay, hey, good, this is for uh, the rest of America that doesn't know any better. Okay, America, we need to, we need to talk here, okay? Because this Nazi thing, it, it's not okay. It, it's really not okay. And I see you, you're rolling your eyes at me, thinking I'm some kind of lunatic up here, losing my mind over what seems to be nothing more than a bunch of idiots waving around these ugly flags, protesting in front of a statue. Except it's not, it's really not. This is not okay. It's not okay that we have Nazis, actual real life Nazis, marching in the streets. This is not okay, none of this is okay. I don't know where you got the idea that this was okay, but it's not, this is not okay. And, and, and I get it, this, this white supremacy thing, it's not new, white power, it's a thing, Ugh, whatever. But America, this is really getting out of hand here. We really need to do something about these people because they're starting to become like a real problem here. A problem we're actually gonna to have to deal with because these people are not going away. Hell, ever since Barack Obama became president, it's been like one big Nazi loving in this country and that is not okay. We have Nazis working for the president. We have Nazis working for cable news. We've got Nazis on the radio. We've got Nazis making movies. We got Nazis on YouTube and Twitter. There's Nazis on Netflix, on Hulu. We got Nazis in the backyard, up the street, down the block. Your neighbors are Nazis, your friends are Nazis. Hell, Marvel Comics even made Captain America a Nazi. <sighs> Nazis are everywhere you look now, and this is not okay, America. <laughs> Nazis have become so prevalent in this country nowadays, there's no more ignoring them. There's no more escaping them. They're all around us. They're here watching us as we go along our daily lives pretending to be our allies, our friends, and our family. 
They've infiltrated our government. They've infiltrated our entertainment. They've infiltrated our families. Nazis are a daily part of our lives now, and this is not okay. America, I get it, America is not an innocent country by any means, okay? We slaughtered and stole lands from indigenous people. We rounded up, we rounded up and concentrated Japanese folk the moment we thought they might be a threat. And we've been threatening to do the same to Muslims ever since 9-11. We want to build a wall to assure the Latinos will always know their place. And we erect statues of slave owners and militarized police in order to assure that black people will always know their place as well. We treated slaves for over 400 years. We literally owned people. We bought and sold people. And none of that is okay. Absolutely none of it. We in here in America, we're all racists, we're all misogynists, homophobes, transphobes, biphobes, and anti-Semites, Islamophobes, and we're damn proud of it. If there's something to hate, by God, we hate it, and we do so as a patriotic duty for God and country, because we were raised to be Nazis. And that is not okay. The difference between us, between America, and Adolf Hitler, is the distance the size of a sheet of paper. And there is a good chance that we've always been this way from the very beginning. America may have always been a secret Nazi empire of fascists, just waiting for an opportunity to assert our power over everyone else. And this is not okay. A lot of you listening are only just starting to realize what some folks have always known, whether they were native, black, Latino, Asian, Muslim, Jewish, female, gay, bisexual, or transgender. We've always known the bottom of the crushing foot of the secret American Nazi. Some of you are only starting to become angry now that the Nazis have stopped hiding, while others of you are angry because we're, only start, we're, we're starting to see you for the Nazis you've always been. Some of you even voted to make America great, not knowing that this was a Nazi battle cry. Because all of us, white and not, were raised with the lie that America was great to begin with. That America wasn't built on genocide and slavery, but instead the wisdom of old rich white men who longed for freedom from taxes. And that is not okay. Another round of applause for Daria. Another reminder for the new people, we have flyers for the next show, October 13th at the local. Our next performer is an unrelenting wordsmith with theatrical style. Please welcome Ariana Island. since I've done a reading, so bear with me. I'm trying to do this one by memory, but we'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called Playlist. You taught me to listen to music. When you said, whatever, I know you hate me. It was the encore to a lifelong playlist. Track one. Stupefy. The guys at your work thought you were the cool dad to take me to the rock show. When I lifted my devil horns to the sky, did you ever think I would damn you? Track two, one more time. You lifted my small body like choreography, but your perspective was hidden by green glass. If you are what you drink, then you were a rolling rock, roiling rockhead, dragging the weight of family to dumpster. The clinking glass toasted to self-resignation. The bottle was always half empty with you. Track three, model man, you were no model man. You sang of imperfection from a thick rock hymnal, dyslexic vision, twisting letters, blaming mom for our poverty. Track four, I will not bow, is a song about someone committed to an endeavor that hurts them, like you. Skip. Track five, the red, was what you saw when bullies made you bait, waiting with bated breath for a beating. You'd asked if I'd seen it too. No. But I came close when I thought you loved your first amendment more than fatherhood. I wailed from a malcontent throat, pulled hair from scalp, and claimed, and, 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 
Pulled hair from scalp, did not break bottles as I hoped you would break your pride and say sorry. With you, I lost the possibility of your apology and gained a paltry imitation from people who had never known your name, building caves for our comments and our chords in the car. We would hotbox our jams and you would track six. Drive. Whatever tomorrow brings, I'll be there with open arms and open eyes. You closed yours, and needles scared you, but I'm the one left with the sound of the track marks and the somber cadence of withdrawal. You are gone. The radio has the nerve to play new music like track seven, Hail to the King. I will never know if you heard this song. You are no longer here to sing with me, and I wonder if we would sing Cigarros, the national city and color arcade fire and heim for pleasure with notes like thread to sew us together these days when I see men tripped up in their lyrics, I grind my teeth to the root of compassion, and I think of you. I let your songs play out. Please know, Dad, that I loved you like you love a skeleton. Let that ring in your bones like music. Thanks. So I wrote that one um, not very long after my dad died. I've got another one that I wrote maybe a year after he died that is, I don't know, thought it would be interesting to follow up with that one, but um, it's also relevant because I have reason to believe my car got totaled this weekend, so that's great. But this is about the car I had before this car that just got totaled, and it's called the Old Malibu. I scrapped your car last week. That fast also ran four-door sedan with three hubcaps and one cassette player. The tow truck reaper came, scraped up what value remained of it, threw it to a junkyard crusher, squeezed memories from the metal of the Malibu. I used to grasp for your good side, watch it drive off with each sip of fuel, that sour oil of pride down the throat that spent life pleading for relief. It's always something, you'd say. Another scratch in the paint, a head-on collision, I've seen every one of your dents. I can't help but love broken things, troublesome before the inevitable comes for the wheels that used to spin, the trips with open windows, the music sung out loud, the cassette tapes, with your voice still on them. Continuing with the sort of happy fun theme, uh, this is a poem that uh, I wrote not long after a friend of mine committed suicide. Uh, not long before she did, um, she made a blog post that was a review of an album. Um, this is, well, this is for her, and this is about that blog post. Uh, the title is a quote from that blog post. It's called, On the Verge of Brilliancy. You were bigger and brighter and whiter than snow. Robert Smith. You praised an album not to be left untitled in your final blog. You would enter, speak, cry out your own name, Tegan, like a prayer for rain, I remember you. A wild queen walking your fascination street, your life a plain song for justice, science, and for living excitement, dancing till close down, until you closed down, sister. When did your love stop? How many love songs did you use to serenade your friend, death, himself? What twisted lullaby sang the merits of going? Idealize the night, there are others in the same deep water as you, and yet you left us. The pictures of you leave an empty corner in all our hearts' parties. Who could have foreseen your disintegration? All your vapor was homesick for heaven, for a peace I did not know to return to you. Did you give yourself to this album you so praised? Was this your last dance, Tegan? So all of those are from my chapbook. 
Uh, it's called After. I only have one copy with me today, but if you would like it, come talk to me. We'll chat. We'll chat. Uh, this last piece is not in that chef book, though, and hopefully it's, uh, it's a little more bright and shiny for you. Uh, da -dum -dum -dum. And it's called... Dear Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> when you founded Facebook, did you ever think you'd make a friend like me? You know everything about me. Favorite movies, favorite books, everything I like. You understand me in that way that paid advertisers understand me. Half the time, I don't even understand myself, so what a blessing it is that I have you. I now know I'm a beautiful statistic. I see you every day, and the way you tell me where everyone I know is at all times is so special. The way you show me other friends' wedding and baby pictures fills this single 20-something with raw, unrefined glee. But lately, I'm noticing a distance between us, so I'm writing you this letter to ask a few questions. Be honest. When I had that conversation about sex over chat, were you reading along live? Were you masturbating? <laughs> when I put in pics from my last days of high school, did you share in my joy, my fear? Did you know on that day I took my diploma, I was mourning a youth slipping past? And when I posted, dad died, love, compassion, rest in peace, were you crying for my family? Did you hear the stories of his swollen liver his lemon yellow skin, his hair thin, his lungs tagged with their cancer, his bile cloudy like privacy policies. Did you hear the nurse say he's gone? Did you hear me punch the wall, ringing sound throughout the internet? Is my father on your timeline? Did the binary vibration of my fist reach you? You missed the funeral. There were two dozen people there. Where were you? I'm sure it was an honest mistake. You're still a great friend. I watch you every day in peaceful, half engagement, waiting for the news, trends, and ads picked just for me. As a reminder, Mark, would you stop running the wedding ring ads? I had a breakup. <sighs> but you already knew that, Mark. I'm concerned that you won't get my letter. So let my face become a viral video on YouTube. YouTube. That thing you don't own yet, and I will get together 300 of my closest friends, and together we will post and repost my face until it trends, and then I will know you heard this. We would do that for you, Mark. That's what friends are for. Thank you. <laughs> One more reminder about the flyers in the back. Our final performer of the evening, afternoon, is a herder of poets, anti-villain, an inspiration initiator. Please welcome me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. All right, so when I say people, you say what? Got it? Okay. Oh, got it. Sweet, sweet. People! What? Put your shopping carts away. <laughs> Surprised Vertigo didn't say it. It means more than you might think to other shoppers and the lowly cart guy who risks his life every day cleaning up after messy, inconsiderate people who leave their carts in the lot and wield 2,000 pound lethal weapons. Sure. Dings and scratches on other people's cars aren't your concern, but heaven forbid a cart come in contact with your car. Oh no, then it's all like Donkey Kong and King Kong put together. <laughs> How dare those idiots scratch my car? I'd sue if I knew who did it. Right. But you don't catch who scratched your car because you did it yourself. 
Remember when you couldn't be bothered to walk the 50 steps to the car corral because you had on new shoes and it was sprinkling? Yes, it matters. It's the golden rule and the butterfly effect and the threefold law all wrapped up into one. There are three steps to avoid getting scratches on your car. Step one, put your shopping carts away. <laughs> Step two, help other people in any way you can. Be tall when they are short. Be steady when they are shaken. Be strong when they are weak. Step three, when you hear a crash of carts coming towards you, stand back. There's a cart man coming through. And remember, if you give of yourself to other people, you will be rewarded, whether it's by God's or the flying spaghetti monster, or karma, or the force, or Newton's law of action and reaction. If you put a piece of yourself out there to help others, you'll get it back. One fold, three fold, seven fold. Yes, it matters because there is so much stuff in the world, we have to start shoveling it into fertilizer. That's a sh I actually was saying shit there. It doesn't make sense when I just say stuff. Because there's so much crap in the world, we have to start shoveling it in the fertilizer. Let's turn the soil together. Black, white, yellow, brown, red, gay, straight, pan, male, female, trans, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, polytheistic, anti-denominational, atheist, agnostic, pagan, Satanist. We all need to contribute. No one can do this alone. But there is one thing we can do ourselves. Put your shopping carts away. Because yes, it matters. <laughs> that poem is from my release, Poemaholic, through Poet Saban. The, the uh, founder and editor of Poet Saban is here. He may have copies. If he does not, I will get some for you. I have a brother one. Poetry, passion, purloined like purses. Stolen, snatched, ensnared from me, words wrangled, wrapped, and weeded till only toothless tragedies remain. Fragmented facades of fantasy's folly, struggling through my sieve of a mind, taken and twisted until untouchable, tangled, and spit like saliva on these lines. A cage of carelessness coerced this course, no fault or flagrant foul performed by others ostracizing or over-criticizing. My deeds were done by only one, my misery, my own misfortune, my own mistakes, misnomers, misanthropy, my own problem. A search for substantial sustenance, intimate intellectual intercourse, and restoring, reanimating the shriveled shell of self I used to be, regaining me. Smoke curls off my cigar. Cigarettes are sexy and more poetic. Listening to hard rock music, blues is more melancholy. Curled up on a futon, a box spring is more desperate. Inside a storage unit, a studio is more artistic. About to meditate, inner turmoil is more attractive. Then I'll take a nap. Insomniacs are geniuses. Then I might go hang out with some people. Being alone is deeper. I could send someone an email. A written letter is more sincere. And I'll go for a walk in the woods. The city is more urbane. And I might discuss children or animals. But politics and religion are, are more important. And maybe I'll go cast a magic spell while others live in the real world. I'll let my insanity rule me as others fight to stay sane. I'll learn from my errors as others continue their strife. And I'll make my life livable while others only survive, then die. Those two pieces were from Hellfire Heaven Sense. I think I have one copy. I don't think I brought it with me, but it's in the. It's in the gallery, which is like three blocks from here. Again, we can get, we can work it out. If you want to get it. Uh, this is a poem I wrote as a present for my niece <clears throat> and her now ex-husband. Love isn't finding the perfect person, 
Love isn't roses and sunshine. Love isn't always being certain that you'll wake and sleep at the same time. Love isn't always the best thing, but it also isn't the worst. But true love will keep you breathing and quenching unquenchable thirst. Love isn't a crowded ballroom and seeing that one person there. Love is closer to stark solitude and feeling that one person cares. Love isn't a chemical firing endorf isn't just a chemical firing endorphins through your nerves. Love can be physically tiring, the emotional roads traversed. Love isn't an answered prayer. Love isn't a gift from gods. Love finds that person to be there through trials, no matter the odds. Our lives take many versions. Love grows through opportunity. Love isn't finding the perfect person, but seeing that person perfect. I don't have any copies of this, so you're shit out of luck. Said don't buy it because you don't want us to buy it. Right? Yeah, it was it was supposed to be a fundraiser, but I couldn't like technically charge for it, so I was like, don't buy this, donate for it. it didn't really work. All right, so last poem of my set and the afternoon, please. After we finish here, we have uh, Skylark and I have a booth over on Rex Street. If you just go out the door and turn to your right and keep walking till you see all the crochet and stuff hanging from the booth, um, please come check us out. We have books out there that are not by, I don't think anybody here that performed had a book out there. <coughs> Andy. Let Andy's know. Um, yeah. Oh, also, this book, I do have copies of it somewhere. So we can work it out. One love and a heart feeling all right. One life and it's all we've got. One heart and it beats in unison. One mind and a symbiotic thought. One smile and it brightens up the dark. One soul and an aura of blood red passion. One truth and our originality survives. One page it decides to stick together and try to create it. One song and it unites with sonic strings. One opinion and it's shared like all the people. One kiss and a heart beats fast to catch up. One act and serenity can return. One peace and it could last forever. Thank you. Good night.